He left the he left behind about a thousand pounds. So I do hand them out to him, but I don't face lectures. <laughs> Thanks for like to Jesus in quite the way that he does. What I liked when he gave that lecture a few years ago is he told us not to open the envelopes. Yes. Yeah. Right. I think they said on the end. In addition, he told us, but I think we have to say do not open. Yeah. How bad? Um, when was it you testified? Or? Uh, Good afternoon. This is uh, a program on public law event on the occasion of commemorating Constitution Day, which was yesterday, but I thought attendance would be a little sparse if we held an event yesterday. So today we're going to uh, talk some about the implications uh, for the Constitution of the War on Terror. It is a much broader topic than we could even hint at covering in the hour or so that we have. So rather than try to give you a superficial overview of lots of different constitutional issues that have arisen since 9-11, I have simply asked uh, our distinguished uh, faculty members, Scott Silliman and Jeff Powell, to accompany me here today and, get, and share with you 10 to 15 minutes of remarks about aspects of this issue that they consider to be significant and important, you shouldn't take by the omission of something that you're concerned about that we consider that unimportant or uninteresting, just that there are limitations in time. We'll try to save some time at the end for questions from you. And I'm going to begin um, the presentations with my own 10 minutes or so, trying to set the stage about a problem that I think is uh, significantly raised by uh, the events post 9-11 and uh, the, particularly the executive branch's reaction to those events. So to set the stage, some 25 years ago, uh, we began hearing an articulation of an approach to constitutional interpretation that uh, went, went and continues to go by the shorthand label, the theory of the unitary executive. The theory of the unitary executive is built upon a very sparse set of words that begins Article II of the Constitution. And I quote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. Uh, you might even say it's built upon a single word, the indefinite Article A in the phrase, I'm sorry, the single singular Article A in the phrase, the executive power shall be vested in a president. When the theory of the unitary executive first began receiving a great deal of attention, the burning questions to which it was being applied largely involved the extent to which Congress could enact statutes that assigned the responsibility to execute federal laws to anyone other than the president. Advocates of the unitary executive asserted, uh, most, uh, most notably, that all the so-called independent agencies of the federal government, everything from the Federal Trade Commission to the Federal Reserve, were unconstitutional because they placed responsibility for executing some federal authority in persons who were protected from the complete and plenary management of the president. 
this implication of the unitary uh, executive was roundly rejected by the Supreme Court in a 1988 decision called Morrison versus Olson. Morrison raised the question of the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute. That statute was enacted after President Nixon had discharged Archibald Cox as special counsel to investigate the water break, Watergate break-in and after he had resigned from office. Congress enacted the statute to set up a process to deal with investigations of high-ranking administrative officials when accusations of criminal behavior were made against them. The independent counsel could operate on an essentially unlimited budget utilize all the powers of the Department of Justice and the investigative services of the FBI and could not be removed from office except for good cause. Under the theory of the unitary executive, the statute was unconstitutional because it placed responsibility to execute federal criminal laws beyond the complete and unfettered control of the president. In an opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, the High Court rejected the challenge to the Independent Counsel with Justice Scalia as the lone dissenter. Since Morrison, questions about the constitutionality of independent agencies subsided, but the keepers of the flame of the theory viewed the case only as a bump in the road and not a fatal setback. The theory has been much on display in the nearly six years of the Bush administration. Quite often, of course, the news reporting on events where the theory is at work do not refer to it by name, although sometimes they do. And I cannot actually recall when any administration official has referred to it by name. But there's little doubt that the intellectual underpinnings of this administration's understanding of power, the power of the chief executive, emanate from the theory of the unitary executive. At the same time, recent events post 9-11 suggests that the description of the theory that I gave a moment ago actually emphasized the wrong syllable. Instead of stressing the article A, I might have better stressed the words executive power. What has become clear in the past six years is just how much the current administration has packed into that term, and what is more, how they have argued that the authorities that are given to the president in Article 3 by this term are his alone to exercise, exclusive of any controls that Congress may try to place on them. For this reason, I think the theory might now better be called the theory of the unilateral executive rather than the unitary executive. Now, all presidents have taken a more robust view of their powers under the Constitution than, for example, the Congress has. This is to be expected. It's part and parcel of the interbranch rivalries that are built into our constitutional structure through the system of separated powers. In particular, presidents throughout our history have frequently asserted the authority to take actions, even though those actions have not been expressly authorized by acts of Congress. In the fields of foreign and military affairs, a rather compelling case can be made that the president does have within his constitutional powers the authority to initiate action in this way. In his book, The President's Authority Over Foreign Affairs, my colleague Jeff Powell makes a compelling case for just such a power of initiative. No president, however, has asserted the authority to disregard congressional prohibitions as frequently as has the current president. This is not the authority to initiate actions I'm talking about, like introducing troops into active hostilities or developing ad hoc systems for detention of detainees in the absence of congressional authorization, but rather the authority to ignore acts of Congress that ostensibly prohibit the action he wants to take, the power, if you will, of unilateralism in the executive. When this power is, has been asserted in formal legal proceedings by the president's lawyers, it's often the argument of last resort, so it sometimes gets lost in the shuffle. Because before unilateralism needs to be asserted, administrative lawyers invariably argue either that the acts of Congress actually do authorize what the president wants to do, or that acts of Congress neither authorize it nor prohibit it, 
so that it ought to be permitted under the President's power of initiative. Nonetheless, the, unilateral, the unilateralism argument has candidly and publicly been made by presidential spokespeople and attorneys, and it's lurking in the background somewhat less candidly in numerous other instances. Just a few of the more um, publicity-heavy examples. In defending the NSA's warrantless surveillance activities, the Department of Justice argues that the Foreign Surveillance Intelligence, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is unconstitutional to the extent that it prohibits the President's ability to do what he deems necessary in the national defense. In defending the detention of Yasser Hamdi, an American picked up on the battlefield in Afghanistan, the administration's brief to the Supreme Court argued that if the Citizen Non-Detention Act were read to prohibit the President from indefinitely detaining Hamdi, it would be an unconstitutional interference with the President's commander and chief authority. In advocating the use of aggressive detention techniques reportedly being used on high-value detainees being held in black prisons by the CIA, the President's defenders have invoked his unilateral authority to extract information. In signing the defense authorization bill that contained the McCain-Feingold Amendment, prohibiting the use of cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment of anyone held in U.S. custody, the President issued a signing statement reserving the right to disregard the prohibition. And in a New York Times op-ed just yesterday, John Yu, who uh, is a former Office of Legal Counsel attorney, uh, in, in some ways one of the major architects of the theory of executive unilateralism, and who's now back at his post on the faculty at Berkeley, summarized the theory being used by the administration in this way. The White House has declared, you writes, that the Constitution allows the President to sidestep laws that invade his constitutional authority. When this claim is combined with a very expansive view of what constitutes executive power, you have the makings for a breath, truly breathtaking assertion of unilateral power. Indeed, it's not hyperbole to say that the administration's view is that anything the President deems necessary to defend the country, to commit troops internationally, to define or repudiate international agreements, or to fight the war on terror domestically, cannot be prohibited by Congress that if Congress has by chance enacted laws or by design enacted laws whose fair interpretation would amount to such a prohibition, those laws are unconstitutional. Now to date, the Supreme Court has been relatively unreceptive to the theory of presidential unilateralism. My colleagues are going to talk to you more about some specific instances, and I'd be happy to answer some questions about them uh, later in the question and answer. What remains to be seen, I think, is what the consequence of a prolonged war on terror will be with respect to the reception, the ultimate reception that executive unilateralism receives. Whenever the president defends his actions in the name of saving American lives and preventing a second 9-11, as he recently did with regard to the interrogation of high-value detainees, he strikes a chord with many Americans who are rightly concerned for their safety and the safety of their children and loved ones. What's unclear is whether a long course of action in which executive unilateralism is consistently asserted will uh, alter, as I think uh, it must if it's going to be successful, the pre-existing existing landscape with respect to separation of powers. So far, the President's folks have advanced the argument in a number of different fora. As I say, the Court has not been receptive to the argument. That is yet to, to uh, bring the curtain down on what the ultimate disposition of this theory will be if we stay in a period of high tension and anxiety uh, for a long or sustained period of time. So with those opening remarks, let me turn it over first to Scott and then to Jeff, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you, Chris. Professor Schrader introduced us to the unitary executive principle, which is really embedded in Article 2, Section 1, what we call the vestiger clause of the Constitution. 
I want to dwell a little bit more on the second clause of Article 2, which is the commander-in-chief power. Because in my, in my view, many of the arguments that are showing up in the briefs that the administration is filing in court actions or in the rhetoric that we are hearing now in the very current debate on military commissions and the Military Commission Act of 2006 is derived solely from the president's authority under Article 2, Section 2. Let me remind us that, that the Congress has the authority under Article 1 to raise and support armies, to provide for and establish a navy, to provide for the calling forth of the militia, and when the several states allow those militia to be federalized, the president as commander-in-chief has authority over them. And perhaps most importantly, the Congress has the authority to declare war and issue letters of mark and reprisal. That's Clause 11 of Section 8 of Article 1. Now, if you go back to the constitutional debates of 18, or 1787, you'll see that the original wording gave Congress the authority to make war. And, and that was changed to the authority to declare war for two very clear reasons. One is that it was recognized that the Congress, a large body of representatives, would be singularly inept in actually prosecuting a war. You need a singular or single decision maker to do that. And more importantly, it was recognized that in the rich history of international law, what we call the jus ad bellum, the authority in international law to use offensive force, that that was always conditioned on the sovereign declaring the intent to use force, declare. And so when the debate ensued and, and James Madison suggested amending that clause from make war to declare war, it was with a clear understanding that the Congress would then have a check on the dog of war. But I would remind us that the last declare war this country has had was World War II. There has not been one since that time. Now, presidents have, over the years, looked at this commander-in-chief authority it's ill-defined in the Constitution. It implies that the president has the authority to operate defensively to safeguard the country. But presidents have expanded the authority under the commander-in-chief authority when it has not been specifically checked by Congress. A couple of cases to, to give you an illustration. One of the earliest ones, 1804, Chief Justice John Marshall, in a case called Little versus Bereem, which many in the uh, Congress cite as a check upon the president because Congress issued a statute, interestingly, restricting the seizure of ships only to those going to a French port rather than to and from. Kind of a strange rule. But John Marshall said, you know, if we didn't have this legislation, it really is suggestive that the president would, without any statutory authority, have the authority to seize ships on the sea. So that's not constitutionally in the text, but John Marshall, as far back as 1804, suggested that that was the authority of the president. Another case, the Nagel case, at the turn of the century, suggested that the president has authority under the Take Care Clause of the Constitution, the implied authority to provide guards to safeguard Supreme Court justices who were circuit riding in the far west of California, a dangerous place at that time. Also the prize cases, Civil War, President Lincoln established a naval blockade after the attack on Fort Sumter. And, and it was without statutory authority. And the Supreme Court in 1863 basically said the President of the United States under international law has not only the authority but the duty to take action, to safeguard the country. Each one of these cases dealing with presidential authority, which is not specifically provided in the text of Article 2, create what Justice Frankfurter in the Steel Seizure case, which Professor Powell will be talking to us more about, created a gloss on executive power, a veneer, an additive to presidential authority. And let me suggest to you that presidents have capitalized on that principle, and they do so today. 
Professor Schrader mentioned the current debate on interrogation techniques, creation of military commissions to prosecute those at Guantanamo Bay, domestic electronic surveillance on you and me as American citizens. And, and you see, when you, when you look at all the administration arguments on this, even in the cases that have been filed challenging NSA surveillance, although the president suggests that maybe the authorization for the use of military force in September of 2001 buttresses this, the real argument he makes is that as commander in chief, I have the duty and obligation to protect the country. And in a series of memoranda coming out of the Office of Legal Counsel, the argument is further developed to the extent, as Professor Schrader suggested, that the president, when he's acting as commander in chief, acts as a tactical battlefield commander. The, the choices he makes as far as how to extract intelligence from detainees or how to prosecute military commissions are akin to battlefield decisions that a military commander can make. And if that's the case, he cannot be constrained by laws that Congress enacts. That's the argument. And so far, at least for the first four years of the war on terrorism since 9-11, Congress very candidly has been on the sidelines. They have been content to let the president work out these issues until perhaps the last four or five months, when all of a sudden Congress has become a little dissatisfied with a sweeping purview of these programs, particularly as it impacts upon not only constitutional rights, but civil liberties. We have little case law on this. In the Hamdan versus Rumsfeld decision of the 29th of June of this year, the United States Supreme Court very forcefully said the president does not have the authority in statute, this authorization for the use of military force, but I read the opinion as acknowledging presidential authority. The president can create military commissions without statutory authority. The Supreme Court said the same thing in 1952 in a case called Madsen v. Kinsella. But the court in June said he can do that only so far as he does not run afoul of congressional constraints. And that's why we're back at the drawing board as far as trying to sort out what military commission should look like. And you've got two opposing bills in the Congress right now, each one of which is called the Military Commission Act of 2006, but with drastically different provisions as far as compliance with the law. Let me suggest to you, in, in closing my comments before I turn it over to my colleague, Professor Powell, that it is absolutely no coincidence that you and I are reminded every single day that we are at war. I mean, it may have been the war on terrorism. It may be a long war. It may be a war against, what's the current phrase, Islamofascism. You see, as long as you and I are reminded that we are in war, and the analogy is to traditional armed conflict as in World War II, then history and legal precedents suggest that the president uses this argument to say that the court should defer to his tactical battlefield decisions and the Congress should not interfere. And as Professor Schrader suggested in his opening comments, if the Congress does try to interfere in the very tactical type of decisions like interrogation techniques, then they may be unconstitutionally legislating and suppressing constitutional authority that belongs to the president. And that's the debate in which we are now in. You may recall Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, who has been castigated in the press of late. He was the one, I think it was about eight months ago, said, well, we really ought to be a little bit more precise in this battle. I think we ought to call it a continued conflict against radical Islam. You know how long that lasted? About nine hours. <laughs> the very next morning, the President of the United States went on national television and reminded us, let there be no mistake, we are at war. That is not a coincidence. That is a theme that you and I will be reminded of for at least the next two years, regardless of any changes that take place in Congress. The problem is no court has yet defined what this war is. The closest we've come is Senator Day O'Connor in the Hamdi case of June of 2004, where she said, with regard to the authorization of use of military force, Professor Schrader's already mentioned this, when you're dealing with 
a United States citizen, yes, it allows for the detention of a citizen, but he must be given some kind of a judicial or a hearing, rather, before a neutral decision maker. And she actually referred to what's called, or in her, in her opinion, she cited Common Article, or Article 5 of the Geneva Convention. But she said, in, just before she referred to that famous, it does not give the president a blank check, she clearly suggested that, as far as the Supreme Court's views are concerned, they have only so far spoken of the conflict in Afghanistan, where Hamdi and others were picked up. There's no court yet that I know of that has defined the global war on terrorism, which according to the administration, encompasses the world as the battlefield and will not be terminated until the last terrorist cell that can do us harm is eradicated. And I think I will be in the grave before that happens. Let me stop there and we'll invite your questions. Jeff? Thank you, Chris and <clears throat> Scott. I appreciate that. Over 50 years ago, the Supreme Court decided Youngstown sheet and tube against Sawyer, sometimes known as the steel seizure case. The case came out of a decision by President Truman during the Korean War to act to prevent a stoppage in the steel industry, which, was, which he anticipated would occur because the steel unions and the steel mill owners could not reach an agreement. Rather than going through statutory procedures that would have permitted the president to accomplish this goal, the president simply issued an executive order instructing the Secretary of the Interior to take control of the mills and run them in the interest of the United States. The Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, held that that was unconstitutional. It was a major, major, major decision that occurs, as far as I can recall, in every single constitutional law casebook, and it is at the very centerpiece of traditional constitutional thinking about the kinds of issues we're discussing today. So what did the court say? Well, the court said several things. It said that the president is not the lawmaker. It is Congress that makes the laws. The court said that when Congress has spoken, then what Congress has said must go. And justice, various concurring justices, in fact, grounded their concurrence in the court's decision directly on the fact that there was a congressional rule that the president had chosen to disobey. Now, it was, at the time, it was a kind of shocking decision. I remember one of my own first-year uh, first law teachers telling me about being in Great Britain when it came down and the astonishment of some of his British peers at the fact that the United States Supreme Court, in the midst of a, to be sure, undeclared war, that the United States Supreme Court in that context, and in the teeth of the executive branch saying, this seizure is absolutely necessary to prevent a grave threat to national security, that in that context, the United States Supreme Court 6 to 3 would hold that, that may be true, Mr. President, but you can't do it. That's kind of the Youngstown model, that the president is not the rule maker, it's Congress, and that when Congress makes the rules, the president may follow them. That's a different context, a different kind of model than the one that Professor Schrader has pointed out the, administ the current administration seems to be using. Well, so what? Politicians and presidents say all kinds of things. Um, Professor Schrader and I, at least, have participated sometimes in helping them say all kinds of things. <laughs> and uh, so what? The law is Youngstown, right? Well, right, but don't be too comfortable. Let me turn, fast forward, almost exactly 50 years from Youngstown to a um, rather more academic event. In the year 2002, a man named Philip Bobbitt published a book, a very big book, fat book, uh, which got a lot of attention at the time, called The Shield of Achilles. Professor Bob is himself an interesting character. He's a lawyer and has served uh, in high-ranking positions in the executive and legislative branches um, in that capacity. And he also has a PhD in something called Strategic Studies and has served on the National Security Council um, in strategic planning for national security matters. 
Uh, so he knows a lot about these kinds of issues, both in terms of policy and in terms of law. Well, I won't try to summarize the big, fat, thick book, but it says a couple of things that I think are extremely interesting for today's uh, discussion. Professor Bobbitt argues that to an extent we do not fully recognize much of the time, domestic constitutional arrangements, the way nations understand their constitutional uh, systems, are shaped by, and indeed uh, almost isomorphic, with the way in which nations perceive their strategic position in the world. That is to say, the way you in fact organize your constitutional arrangements will be will both shape and will be shaped by what you feel your nation needs to do in the world, what threatens it, what its goals are, and so forth. And Professor Bobbitt argues that if you take, if you recognize this, then you can anticipate, and history shows that you will be right in doing so, that in situations where there is a change in the perception of the world, you can expect the actual effective constitutional arrangements of a society to change. So that, for example, in a world of the sort that he saw ours becoming, one characterized by a change in strategic threats, to use his language, and he wrote the book almost entirely before 9-11, so it's, um, he's, it's not driven by um, <clears throat> that event. In the world that he saw coming to be, he said a number of things are going to happen. And there are going to be changes that lead to, for example, a strong emphasis on executive power, on a powerful, centralized, and above all, trusted executive that can deal with threats that are now not just external, but internal. That the entire concept that he sees as characteristic of 19th and 20th century legal thinking of, well, you have a world of domestic affairs, and then you have a world of external affairs, and these two things can be kept apart conceptually, and in terms of policy, and in terms of law, that, that that's going to disappear, that it's not going to, you're not going to be able to think in terms of spheres of that sort. <coughs> And that the result will be not just an aggrandizement of executive power, but also a de-emphasis on what he calls the legalistic aspects of governance. Well, all right, what's this academic discussion have to do with Youngstown, Sheet, and Tube against Sawyer? Well, let's think about it. A time of a change in the perception of what threatens your nation is likely to lead to a change in the way your domestic constitutional arrangements are thought of. All right, well, we do live in the post-9-11 world in a situation where the, the picture of, of the United States' place in the world and of its needs as an international actor have changed enormously since Professor Silliman and Professor Schrader and I went to law school, where the, the picture of a bipolar world with two superpowers locked in a, in a cold war has given way to a very different one, and one in which the, the picture of national boundaries being significant, either in terms of conflict or in terms, terms of what governments do, has significantly changed. So the way we perceive things, we're in the situation of change about that. Well, then that would lead us, if Professor Bobbitt has his finger on something, and I personally think he does, to expect there to be at least pressure within our domestic constitutional arrangements to rethink them. And so one thing that we may be seeing right now is exactly this kind of process of rethinking. Now, Professor Bobbitt is at least ambivalent or perhaps ambiguous or both about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Some of you may think a rethinking is important some of you, and worthwhile. Some of you may think it's desperately scary. And I'm not here to tell you which one to think. But either way, we can all ask ourselves, all right, well, how, what, could there be such a rethinking? Um, isn't it the case that a decision like Youngstown shows that there's a kind of rock bottom principle in American constitutionalism which checks and reigns in the executive? Well, I'm not so sure. Let me read you a couple of things from, um, from Youngstown. This is from the lead opinion, the, which was styled the opinion of the court by Justice Black. 
He's responding to the argument that the administration made that the commander-in-chief power, the one that Professor Silliman was talking about, that the commander-in-chief power authorized the president to seize those steel mills. And Justice Black rejects that argument. He says, the government attempts to make the argument by citing a number of cases upholding broad powers in military commanders engaged in day-to-day -day fighting in a theater of war. Well, that may be so, Justice Black says. It may be that in a theater of war such actions can be taken without congressional approval. But such cases need not concern us here because even if the theater of war be an expanding concept, it doesn't apply to the domestic affairs of the United States. Well, now think about that way of distinguishing powers that might be quite broad if the, we were in a theater of war, and therefore the executive might be able to exercise on its own, notwithstanding the lack or perhaps even in the teeth of congressional authorization. Think about that way of conceptualizing things in a world in which well, where was the battlefield on September the 11th, 2001? All right. Now let me read you something from the, the famous concurrence of Justice Robert Jackson. Justice Jackson's opinion is often taken to um, <clears throat> be uh, even more important than Justice Black's opinion of the court. And one of the things that Justice Jackson um, uh, says there is that when the president is acting in the teeth of congressional rules, the kind of thing that Professor Solomon, for example, was talking about. In that circumstance, you have the strongest presumption against the president, because the president is acting, uh, Jackson uses a kind of pseudo-algebraic uh, way of thinking about it, but you've got to take the president's power and subtract away all of Congress's power. And only if there's a, rema a positive remainder could the president act. Well, that sounds, you know, if you are disturbed about current developments, that sounds reassuring. And, and it suggests uh, that maybe there's not so much change possible under Youngstown. But go on to read some other parts of Jackson's opinion that aren't um, usually included in case books. Jackson says, We should not use this occasion to circumscribe, much less to contract the lawful role of the president as commander-in-chief. I should indulge the widest latitude of interpretation to sustain his exclusive function to command the instruments of national force when turned against the outside world for the security of our society. Now, I have no doubt myself that Robert Jackson thought that that sentence was one that, while making the appropriate concession that in the theater of war over there, the president has vast and, at least at times, exclusive powers that his sentence had not compromised Congress's power in the domestic sphere because, of course, there is an outside world and a domestic sphere. But are there such things conceptually, rhetorically, factually, and Bobbitt will lead us to ask, or legally, is there such a division between the outside and the inside, between the external and the domestic in the world of the 21st century? And to the extent that, as I think we must agree, or I myself think at least, <clears throat> to the extent that the language of Black and the language of Jackson reads very differently when you play it on to the 21st century, then the possibility Professor Bobbitt warns or celebrates of significant constitutional change in our system is not only um, possible by uh, overt change, but possible by change that retains the outer facade and the language of our tradition. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And Scott. No, we've got some time for some questions. Yes. Um, this is for Professor Solomon. I was wondering, you discussed how Congress is becoming increasingly aware and active of the president's expanding use of power. And my question for you is, how much of that do you think is because of the upcoming elections for both for Congress and also in the case of McCain for 2008? I think it is not directly tied to the election, although obviously um, the Republicans, notably John Warner, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, 
acknowledge the political environment in which they're speaking. I think it's more fundamental than that. Uh, a phrase I've used in many places is that I think how we respond, we being Congress, responds to act as a counterweight to the president, and as Professor Powell suggests, perhaps actually legislating, but very precisely in this area, I think it says more about us than it says about those that seek to do us harm. Uh, the, the current debate right now, which you're reading about in the papers, is can Congress or can the administration's bill basically redefine what's called Common Article Three of the Geneva Convention? Many people really don't understand the significance of that, but certainly John McCain does, because he was a prisoner of war in the Hanoi Hilton in the Vietnam War. So it is certainly political. I think the administration would like to make it very political. That's why there's a, a tremendous amount of pressure for Congress to do something before the 29th of this month when they go home to campaign. Uh, I'm not so sure that'll happen now. I think they'll probably be going to what we call conference to resolve the House and the Senate bills. But I think it's more fundamental, and it, and it ties together what I think all three of us are trying to say, is that in a new strategic global environment, which we all agree is very different than it existed in the Korean War when steel seizure was authored, I think we have to come up with some definition of presidential authority under the, either under the vestiger clause or under the commander in chief clause, which is meaningful in terms of this new environment. I don't know how we're going to do that. Will the courts do it? I'd, I really had hoped they, had done, they would take the opportunity to do it, either in Razul in 2004 or in Hamden. They did not. Congress has not yet with precision done it, but I think it drastically needs to be done because right now we're in kind of a standoff with the NSA surveillance program, which the president is basically saying that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is cumbersome. It constrains me. The same thing is being said about the Detainee Treatment Act with regard to interrogation techniques. This argument is being played out in many different applications of presidential power in the war on terrorism. It needs to be defined, be it Congress or the court. But I, don't th I think it's a whole lot more than a political issue or a politicized issue. I think it really hits at the bedrock of our national values. I'm going to give you just a slightly different take on essentially the same facts with which I don't disagree with Scott. I think until the Hamdan decision, uh, the leadership in the Congress and the administration had shown remarkably little interest in having Congress do anything <coughs> to regularize a commission practice in Guantanamo, which people in the Congress had proposed to do Weeks after the Guantanamo setup was announced by the president in November of 2001, and the leadership had suppressed those activities, and the administration had said, no, we're fine. <laughs> we don't need any congressional authorization. So it took the Hamdan decision to say, these commissions, in effect, are dead in the water. Because although there is authority to authorize commissions already existing, I agree with Scott about that, these don't comply. Now it became necessary if you're going to move the commission process forward at all for there to be some enabling legislation. And then if, I think the issue has, in fact, as Scott says, become highly politicized because people are still trying to calculate what the, where is the best political advantage here. I think there's some sentiment in the Republican Party that it would actually be a good idea not to have a bill because then we can go run against Democrats in the midterm elections as the people who are preventing these high-value detainees from actually coming to justice. The folks who were in the CIA black prisons, apparently, are, that are now being transferred to Guantanamo that the president announced uh, in his uh, nationally televised address. So I think politics is, as everything, uh, as any big issue in, in uh, the capital these days, or uh, not these days, forever, it's, there's a highly, highly charged political content to them. But I don't think that the administration was very interested in any kind of legislative initiative until uh, the court actually forced their hand. Yes? Uh, has there been any post-9-11 legislation besides, let's say, the Patriot Act that would give some sort of clout to what the president has been doing? Well, of course, there's the authorization of the use of hey, military well, uh, force, which um, is um, considered by the administration to be an omnibus, we can do anything we want uh, 
piece of legislation. That's, the, that's argument number 1A or 1B you know, whenever they're defending actions is that the uh, authorization to use necessary and appropriate force justifies their activity. And it's clear the court to a degree is uh, sees the AUMF as a substantial grant of, president, of congressional authority to, to uh, the president. The, where the more particularized issues come up is when you have uh, other statutory uh, pieces in the landscape that complicate the question and, and the court has been unwilling to read it, the AUMF, as broadly granting plenary authority to the administration as they want. But I would say those are the two most substantial pieces of legislation since 9-11 would be the Patriot Act, which affected largely uh, domestic surveillance and investigative authorities, uh, plus did a lot of other things, and then the AUMF that, that uh, uh, sanctioned the use of force and uh, all of its attendant uh, appurtenances once you get into an armed conflict. What has always been puzzling to me is that when the Congress, with really little debate, passed the initial Patriot Act in November 2001, as Professor Schrader said, they gave the president sweeping authority. And they did, to a very large extent, change a substantial part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act with a word change from the purpose for, foreign in, for electronic surveillance justification to a significant purpose, which, if you study it, is a, is a sea change in justification. But I'm convinced that there's another provision in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, 1811, that basically says the president can surveil without a specific warrant from the FISA court in a time of declared war for up to 15 days. And I, I've always thought, why didn't the administration go over to Congress at the same time they were getting these sweeping changes in that statute and just say, this is an anachronism. We're never going to have another declared war. Why don't you amend this to say the president can surveil for 30, 60, whatever days in a time of national crisis or grave threat to the United States as jointly agreed to by the president of the Congress? Congress, I think, would have readily given him that authority. But I think it's really tied in. The reason they didn't is tied in more with what Professor Schrader talked to us about, this concept of the unitary executive that a robust presidency that can do whatever it wants to in protecting the United States against attack does not need congressional authorization. And it's the development of that concept that I think was of concern to the administration if they asked for too much early on. Now I think we're seeing the administration recognizing because of the Supreme Court decision in Hamdan and other court challenges, that perhaps the administration is now pulling back a little bit, now going to the Hill for NSA surveillance, our inspector's bill, uh, the Military Commission Act, uh, the fight over the interrogation techniques, and saying, we really do think we need that foundational buttressing now of presidential authority to help us get over this current challenging time. Yes. Uh, first of all, you mentioned that historically as the nature of the threat changes, our conception of the kind of um, executive power also changes, or is reevaluated at least. How much of this current kind of unilateral executive that Professor Schrader talked about um, is specific to this administration, and how much of it is just um, a byproduct of the nature of the threat changing? And I guess, and also, how much will that change or stay the same after 2008? Well, the, um, as, as Professor Schrader said, the, the theory of the unitary executive is, is at least a quarter century old, and it's got themes that go back, you know, all the way back to Alexander Hamilton. Um, so the, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the specific issues and a lot of the um, arguments are, are, are retread. On the other hand, uh, the unitary executive, I mean, it's very striking. The unitary executive theory comes to full, full blossom in the, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and the court, the Supreme Court slaps the administration, the then administration down very hard, rejecting in a place where I'm not terribly sympathetic to the theory myself, but a place where I think the theory has some bite, which is the Independent Counsel Act. You can have a federal prosecutor who has not under the control at all of anybody, and the court upheld that eight to one, as Professor Schrader said. Well, that was then and now is now. And I think the, what's significant may be not the novelty of arguments, but the novelty of the context in which people evaluate them. And that, would, and that context has, has changed significantly, and that would lead me to think that at least as a possibility that how we see the issues changes. You know, interestingly, when you go back to the case that Professor Powell talked about, steel seizure, and you read beneath 
the surface or between the lines of the Frankfurter opinion or Tom Clark's opinion. And you will see that in many cases, each, not each, but many of the justices that comprise that 6-3 majority actually had, if changing circumstances were apparent, then they might be persuaded. Uh, and, and so that's why I'm suggesting that how the administration paints the context, as Jeff has just said, is vitally important to whether the courts will support it or not. If, if we are at a high threat or tantamount to a declared war, I think, I think Douglas would have gone the other way in a declared war. I think you would have had a totally different posture of the court in steel seizure. Uh, but that's why how we look at this is vitally important to how the court responds to this presidential authority argument. Yes. I'm presuming I'm in a room full of critical thinkers, so I'm wondering why no one has questioned the basic premise of the conversation, in that how do we know that the war on terror wasn't a fraud perpetrated on the American people to create uh, unlimited presidential powers, take us into the war in Iraq, and, and uh, those sorts of implications from that, that question, very basic question that gets to be asked. And it, uh, speaks to all the issues that are going on with Guantanamo and other things as well. And when you look at 9-11 as a crime rather than as an act of war, we don't really know whether it was a crime or an act of war. There's been no proof that's ever been presented in any sort of legal form as to who did the crime, whether the alleged, alleged terrorists really were the ones who did it, etc. And Bruce Lawrence himself, our own Islamic scholar, has said that the recent uh, Bin Laden tapes are likely fakes. And and we also need to realize that this is spreading into the university systems and limiting academic freedom as well. There have been three scholars around the country who have been persecuted for their views on 9-11 at the University of New Hampshire, uh, Wisconsin-Madison, and Brigham Young University. And I've written an article in the Chronicle today on 9-11 and academic freedom, and I'd like you to read it. But I appreciate some response to whether anybody's questioning the basis of the war on terror itself. Herman Goering in the Nuremberg trial said, the best way to take people to war is to convince them they're being attacked and uh, denounce the pacifists as being unpatriotic. It works the same way in any country. That's a quote from 1946. Yep. Well, I think there's a lot of questioning of whether the conceptualization of war <coughs> is the right conceptualization or whether uh, the criminal process is the appropriate one here. I said at the outset it was much too broad a set of topics to deal with all of them today. And, and uh, we've, we've chosen to, uh, to deal with the ones that we have. It's not meant to preclude other conversations occurring in other places. So we got one more question. I was just wondering how you would see the uh, recent shifts in the makeup of the court as affecting these. Uh, it, seems to be, it seems to me you're suggesting there's sort of this impending crisis of what is the power of the executive. And you know, um, since Hamdan, we've had two new justices added. How does that affect it, uh, especially given uh, Chief Justice Roberts' involvement in the case of the appeals court justice? Of course, you had Alito on the court. Roberts did not participate because he had to recuse himself because he was among the three judges at the D.C. Circuit Court. I, I'm not sure that from Hamdan to the next case, you would see that much of a difference. I think many of us view Justice Kennedy as being the key to many of the court's uh, coming challenges uh, before it, simply because we, we've got a lot of cases brewing, um, all being consolidated right now in the Northern District of California on the NSA surveillance, either the data mining or the voice communication. You're going to have further court challenges, regardless of what the Congress does on military commissions. I will guarantee you that Neil Katyal and others will try to bring constitutional challenges uh, on that system. Uh, but I, I think that the court that wrote Hamdan would not be significantly changed by just Chief Justice Roberts joining. I think, I think Kennedy is the approach, but I think Professor Powell is certainly my expert on this area. Jeff? <clears throat> Presidents attempt to choose justices who they think will pursue the, no, we won't have to put this in a narrow focus, but pursue the goals and adopt the attitudes that the president thinks are correct and appropriate for the court to take. Um, presidents sometimes get disappointed. That's always tried that fact, which is a fact. It always gets trotted out when people who are worried about some presidential nominee um, uh, want to reassure themselves. 
Presidents sometimes are disappointed. They are often not. <laughs> presidents are often quite good, and I think they have probably gotten more concerned and better at choosing people who they can, whose views they can predict, not because of any corruption or anything wrong with the justice. You're just choosing somebody whose view, worldview is similar to yours. I, uh, I'm quite confident that this administration did what a democratic administration would have done, that is to say choose, try to pick people who would have the same worldview. Uh, I'm willing to assume that they did a good job, and I would point out that the Chief Justice and Justice Alito, uh, if they have long and healthy lives, as I hope they do, will be on the court a very long time. Although they, like us, might be dead. Before well, before, the, before uh, that happens. Then all this becomes boot. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if it exists. Um, thank you all for coming. Let's uh, help me thank Scott and Jeff.